new work about the topic. And uh, so we say that f is multiplicative if f of m times n is always f of m times f of n when the greatest common device of f m and n is one. And in this talk, I will concentrate on multiplicative functions taking values in minus one plus one. So they are bounded and real valued for purposes of this talk. And um, I give some examples first of multiplicative functions. So the Möbius function, which is zero if n has a square factor, and otherwise it's minus one if n has odd number of distinct prime factors, and it's plus one if n has even number of distinct prime factors. And another example is the indicator function of the set n of numbers that can be written as a sum of two squares. So this is one if p is one or two mod four. So it's one mod four, or it's the prime two. And for primes that are three mod four, it's one only if the power of prime is even. So in particular, any prime that is three mod four is not representable as a sum of two squares. And it's zero if it has an odd power of a prime mod, which is three mod four. And a third example of a multiplicative function taking bounded values is the indicator function of the set of y smooth numbers. And by y smooth, I mean a number whose all prime factors are up to y. So this is three sort of fundamental examples of multiplicative functions. And if one looks also at unbounded function, then for instance, divisor function is an example, but I won't today talk about those. And I'm interested about averages of multiplicative function. What's the average value? And let's first consider long averages over the interval from one to x. And these are well understood. It is known that the mean value of a multiplicative function is zero if f doesn't pretend to be one, if the values at primes is, are not close to one. And otherwise, the mean value is non zero and can be calculated. So I will give the details. So if f is typically about one, if the sum of one minus fp over p converges, this means that for most primes, fp is one or very close to one. In this case, the average of the, the mean value of the function fn can be calculated, and it's this product here. And it's a converging product, thanks to this condition. And on the other hand, if f is not close to one for most primes, if this condition doesn't hold, then it is known that the mean value of f is zero. And if we, for instance, look at the Möbius function at primes, the Möbius function takes the value minus one. So one minus minus one is plus two. So this series definitely diverges. So this is the case of Wersing's theorem, where one doesn't hold, it's a diverging series. And from that, we know that the average value of the Möbius function is zero. And this is actually equivalent to the prime number theorem, saying that the number of primes up to x is x over log x. And also equivalent to the Riemann set of functions not having zeros in the real part, s equal to one. So this sort of fundamental result in number theory. And these are sort of qualitative results, but there is a theorem of Halas that gives one quantitative results one gets more, depending on how this sort of sum behaves, one gets precise amount of cancellation in this sum and so on. But what's my topic today are the short averages. If we look at the average of fn over short interval, then previously Maxim and I showed, it was published in 2016, we showed that if one looks at almost all very short intervals of length h, with h tending to infinity with x as slowly as you wish, if we compare the very short average, we take a very short segment of n's and calculate the average of that segment, then the average is very close to the average over the long segment. And this is what we know by Halas theorem and so on. We know how to evaluate this. So essentially, we get the same story for the very short intervals for almost all x. So as soon as h tends to infinity, the error term here tends to zero and the 
exceptional set tends to be the row of x. So we got a good result for almost all short intervals. And this has led to numerous applications, developments such as Peritao's resolution of logarithmic average in Sova conceptual concerning essentially the correlations of Mobius function and also Tao's resolution of the Erdős discrepancy problem. But even though there are still few shortcomings about this theorem, and in this talk I will discuss our new work which addresses these shortcomings. We get a better results in several senses. And the first shortcoming is that the quantitative bounds are pretty weak. Here we win uh, log h to small power, and in the paper we get a bit better result than this, but still at the best we win the small power of log x in the exceptional set. So the bounds are not very good. And second thing is that if we look at the example of the indicator function of the sums of two squares, then this theorem becomes trivial. The sums of two squares have sp mean spacing like log x to half, which means that the if we look at this long average, it's already zero. It's of size log x to minus half, which means that it's much smaller than the error term we get here. So this theorem doesn't help us in determining how these sort of vanishing multiplicative functions behave in short intervals. It doesn't tell us anything about sums of two squares because we already know that almost all intervals don't contain any sums of two squares if the interval length is very small and for longer intervals it doesn't give us anything non-trivial. So that's a bad thing about the theorem. And a third thing is that for many applications one needs results for a complex f. This original result is only for the real value of f and uh, actually in this form it doesn't hold for complex f because f might be say n to it and in this case the short version doesn't quite pretend to be the long version but there must be a twist and uh, in this new work we also address this case of complex f but in this talk I will concentrate on the case of the real function f. Okay so let's go into the example of sums of two squares. So recall that n is the set of numbers that can be written as a sum of two squares and it is well known that the number of sums of two squares of x is x over log x to half times a constant and in particular this means that if you got the average gap between numbers that can be represented as a sum of two squares then the average gap is of size log x to half. And in particular this means that if we look at intervals shorter than the average gap then typically there are no numbers in n in that interval. So for typical y smaller than h1, the short average is simply zero. But if we look at longer intervals than the average gap, then one would expect that we have regular behavior. If we look at a short interval, whose length is somewhat longer than this average gap log x to half, then we expect that we get asymptotic formula for almost all short intervals of this length. As soon as the length divided by the average gap log x to half tends to infinity. So this is what one would expect to hold. And uh, this is what we saw, that it's actually true. So we saw that given any delta and any h naught, if we look at the number of integers that can be represented as a sum of two squares in an interval of length h naught times log x to half, which is also the mean spacing, then it corresponds to the long density. This is the density of integers in this interval, and this is the density of integers representable as a sum of two squares in longer interval, in the interval of length x. And what we get is that this is smaller than the main term, delta times the main term, for all but at most x times h naught to minus c delta to 12 integers. The point is that this is sort of polynomial exceptional set in h naught, and this holds for some constant c which we have exp explicitly but it's quite small. And note here 
did that the exceptional set saves polynomial in H0, and that we get a result where the error term now takes into account the size of the main term. Previously, we just had log h to some small power here, which wasn't helpful at all for this sort of very short intervals. But now we get a non trivial result as soon as the length of the interval tends to log x to is log x to half times something tending to infinity. And we get an exceptional set which tends to be to log one, and it tends so quite rapidly. And um, this improves on the result of Hooley, who showed that for almost all x, one has a lower bound for this of right order of magnitude, but he didn't get asymptotic. So we improve by getting an asymptotic formula for almost all x that than just the order of magnitude. Kaiser? Yes. Uh, we have a question from Igor Sparlinsky. Igor, could you please ask the question by unmuting your, your microphone? Thank you. Uh, Kaiser, so you say that C is a function of delta, but then what's the meaning of delta to the 12th next to it? Uh, oh, sorry. So it's not a function of delta. It's an absolute okay. constant. Okay. So, so it's an absolute constant. Yeah, it's an absolute constant. Right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You can't just see delta here, but then yeah. I tend to delta to 12. Yeah. But yeah, it's an absolute constant. It's like, I think okay. it's like 2000 to minus 12 or something like that. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so this is for the function system, and we can do the same thing more generally. So let's first study long averages of sort of vanishing multiplicative functions. I'm saying that the multiplicative function is vanishing if it's zero pretty often. So let's say that the fp has average value alpha or some alpha between zero and one. Then it's known that the average value of Fn is like log x alpha minus 1. More precisely, it's like this. This, you get the product of Fp minus 1 over p. But if, if it has the average value of alpha, then it's of this size log x to alpha minus 1. And now we write h1 for the inverse of this. And because Fn has mean value like this, then if it takes values 0 and 1 to the absolute value, then the average of Fn in intervals of length h1 is typically 0, because this is, again, similar to the scale of two squares. This is the mean spacing of the values, because this is the mean, and then the mean spacing is the inverse of it. So again, if we look at intervals of shorter than h1, then the, typically the average of Fn is 0. And we don't have a Interesting theorem, but again, as soon as the length of the interval is longer than the mean spacing, we expect that we get a meaningful result, which is that we get that for almost all x, the short interval average is of the same size as the long interval average. And we have an error term, which is of smaller order of magnitude than the main term. This is the order of the main, main term, and we get a we do all. So this is what one expects to have. And this is what we prove again. So we have f is a multiplicative function whose average value at the times is at least optimal. Say we don't request that the average is exactly something. We just request that if we get x equals longer than dyadic, then the proposed was at least. Kaiser, sorry for interrupting you again. So the audio is a bit uneven. Um, perhaps, are you? Maybe perhaps speak a bit closer to the microphone. Sometimes it, the, 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 the volume is a bit uneven. OK, I will try to do that. Thanks a lot. OK, so we have this theorem which says that if the average value of f at primes is at least epsilon, so that it's not 0 for all the primes in the long intervals, then we get the result that we wanted. So h1 is the expected gap between non-zero values of f. And then for any delta and any h naught, we get that the short average is the same as long average apart from an error term, which is smaller of smaller size delta times the size of the long average for all. But again, we have a polynomial exceptional set. 
and now the constant C and kappa depend on the proportion of non vanishing But anyway, we get the same story for all multiplicative functions that don't vanish too much. They have to have a positive average, essentially at the prime. And then we get the sort of result that in short intervals of the expected length, we can get, get the same average for f as in the long intervals. And we get the same result for complex power f, but then we have to have a, an twist in main term and it doesn't look very nice, but it's a natural twist that we have to take, but I don't talk about the complex case anymore. Okay, so let's get back to the sums of two squares. Recall that Huli was able to show that for almost all x, one gets the correct order of magnitude of sums of two squares in intervals of length h naught times log x12 for any h naught tending to infinity with x. And uh, who we did this in a different way than us. His main arithmetic information was the solution for the shifted convolution problem for the coefficients of the Dedekind set of function of, of the Q QI. And these are essentially the number of representations of n as sum of two squares. So this is what, what, what allowed who to show this, his result that one has a good one knows asymptotic formula for this shifted convolution problem, but it's worth pointing out that it is completely out of reach if one looks at number here of degree rather than two. If one takes the coefficients of the detecting set of function of any number field that has degree greater than two, then there is no way one can do the shifted convolution problem, which means that if one wants to generalize Hugi's result, it doesn't work. It's completely, the approach completely fails because we don't have this crucial arithmetic information. But on the other hand, in our case, we only use multiplicativity of the function, so we have chances to generalize. In particular, we don't need the density of the as a prime to be half. For the case of some of two squares, the, the density of the fp at primes is half, but we can have epsilon for the density, so we are allowed to go into higher, higher degree number fields for generalization. And so we will talk about norm forms. The sum of two squares are norm forms in QI. And now I will talk about higher degree extensions. So let's take a number field K. And we say that N is a norm form if it's a norm of an algebraic integer in K. This is a stronger condition that just requiring that it's a norm of an ideal, we make a stronger condition here. And we write C A of N for the indicator function of this case. So in particular, if we look at C of QI, then it's the indicator function of sums of two squares. And there is some work on, of Odoni on the having these norm forms. And in particular, he shows that the density of norm forms of K is this product which look quite similar to the products we have had before. So it's the product of all primes for which there doesn't exist an integral idea of norm P, 1 minus 1 over P. And in particular, if K is a normal extension of degree K, then this is of size log X to minus 1 plus 1 over K. So essentially it means that comparing to the condition we had before is that the average of time is of size 1 over k, and with k tending to infinity, the average of primes tends to 0. But there is one issue. When the class number of k is larger than 1, then this function p k n is not multiplicative. So we are not able to directly use our results for this p k of n. Density is not an issue, but the issue is that it's not multiplicative. But for this, the same work of Odoni helps us to show that CK of N can be written as a linear combination of complex valued multiplicative functions. And then we can apply our results to each function in the linear combination. This is a theorem in any number field. So let me write this theorem here. So we take K to be any number field over Q, and we take delta KX to be the density of norm forms in, in K. 
up to x. And then we get an asymptotic formula for the number of integers that can be represented as a sum of norm, as norm forms in short intervals of the, as soon as it's possible, I mean in intervals of length longer than the average gap. And uh, we get an asymptotic formula for number of norm forms in short intervals for almost all x. And again, we get a polynomial exceptional set. Okay. And this greatly extends Huy's work, which only worked for ui, and which didn't have an asymptotic formula. So we get uh, a very wide extension of his work. Okay. And Huy also studied another question concerning sums of two squares. He studied the gaps between sums of two squares. So remember that the average gap is log x to half, but then the question is how often do gaps of this length or like this longer length appear? And so writing SI for the sequence of numbers that are sums of two squares, who we proved that if we take the gamma moment of the gap function and sum it over the gaps, then we get an asymptotic formula for this. And in other words, this means that for any interval length h, and for any interval in of length h times log x to half, the number of x's such that this interval doesn't contain sums of two squares is at most of all the x times h to minus two and two times zero. So this is essentially equivalent these two things. So you get a good exceptional set here. Here, if one doesn't require an asymptotic formula, but it happy with the existence of sums of two squares in short intervals. And again, Huy's work is based on the shifted convolution problem for RKN, and so it doesn't extend beyond quadratic number fields. If the degree of the number field is greater than two, then Huy's work doesn't have any chance to generalize the current knowledge about the shifted convolution problem. But for us, we again use only multiplicativity. So if we don't anymore want an asymptotic formula like before, we get the exceptional set for any k. The better exceptional set than we had previously. So this is the result. Maxim and I have about gaps. So if k is any number field and delta k is the density of norm forms, then for any interval of length, Long, h times longer than the average gap, we get that the number of intervals that don't contain the correct order of magnitude norm forms is of size, the exceptional set is of size h times h to minus half plus epsilon. So in the previous result, I showed that we had, we had that we got asymptote formula for this, but we had exceptional set that had a very small power here. Now we have the exceptional set which has size x times h2. Kaisa, um, I'm not hearing you uh, at the moment. Um, okay, I'm not sure what I can do about that. Okay, it's better now. I can hear you now. It was okay, I would, I would try to be closer to the Okay, computer. thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, if we don't want an asymptotic formula, but just want the correct order of magnitude of norm forms, then we can get a good exceptional set for the number of exceptional set intervals. So all but this many intervals contain expected order of magnitude of numbers that are known forms in K. And if we look at Huggy's problem of looking at the gamma moment of the gaps, then we get the asymptotic formula for gamma up to three over two. And remember that Huggy had this for gamma up to five over three, which is a bit larger than our exponent, but worked only for the case of K equal to QI and our prismatic extends to any number fields. And also in the forthcoming work, we are able to do the QI 
case for all gamma up to two by using some properties of the Ledeckin zeta function for the QI. So anyway, this is generalizes who is the result to any number field. Okay. And this is not restricted just to known forms, but this result work for other multiplicative functions. So for instance, we can study gaps between sums of two squares. If we look at the number of intervals from x to x plus h, which do not contain an x to epsilon smooth number, where the number of them is a, at most x times h to minus half plus eta for any eta. And consequently, we get a corresponding result for the gamma powers of the gaps for gamma up to 3 over 2 again. And this improves on the recent result of Heatran, who had this, this uh, for this gamma moment, he had an upper bound of size x to 1 plus eta. The lower bound that it's at least x is trivial, but he got the upper bound x to 1 plus eta, but now we get asymptotics. So we can use this for also for studying other multiplicative functions and gaps between multiplicative sequences. Okay. And let me now move on to some of the ideas in the proofs. I will concentrate on what's new in this, uh, in this work compared to our previous work, but I don't expect that you know how our previous work worked. So for simplicity, let's just concentrate on the case when the average of f is zero. This means that we don't have to worry about the main term. And uh, the starting point for us is Perron's formula, which lets us to express this sort average as a Perron integral, as an integral in the complex plane, where we have the corresponding Dirichlet series in the middle. And uh, this x plus h and x come from the ending points and starting points of the interval. And this expression here can at least morally be estimated by the mean value theorem to be h times the derivative of this at x, which is h times x to it. So we can morally write this sum of fn over f into our sense of h in this form. We can sensibly truncate the integral by this And if now we just put absolute values here, we are in trouble because we always hope in analytic number theory that we have square root cancellation and we can't hope for more. And if we had square root cancellation in this n sum, it would be of size x to minus half. And multiplying by h and x over h would mean that the right hand side with absolute values would be of size x to half. But the trivial bound for the left hand side is h, which is much smaller. So this is not a good idea to put absolute values here. Instead, we have to somehow take advantage of the fact that we are allowed to add it over h. We have to somehow take take advantage of the oscillations of x by t. And what one would normally go on to do is to take a square mean. We want to get a result for almost all x. So we can take a square mean of this. And if we get a good one for the square mean, we, then we get that this is small except for a small exceptional set. And uh, if we take a square mean of this and square out and do some work, we find out that we get an upper bound of this form, where we get the mean square of the same Dirichlet polynomial here. And now we don't anymore have this problem that if we have square rule cancellation, we are in trouble. So that's good. OK, so that's what one would normally do. And recall that we had chosen this h, the length of the interval is h naught times h1. The h1 is the sort of average gap between the numbers. And so if we want to show our desired result, that this short average is of size delta times the density of f, then, and we wanted to get a polynomial exceptional set, then for this thing here, we would need a bound that is of size this squared times the wanted exceptional set. So what we would like to assume here would be that we get the mean square of the Dirichlet polynomial is of size that, uh, times h naught to this power of theta kappa times the square of the mean value of the f. And this is this if we could show this, we would be done. Okay, 
So this is what we would need to be done. And there is a mean value theorem for dirigate polynomials, which tells us that this mean value here is at most of size the length of the interval plus the length of the sum times the mean square of the terms. And uh, we can prove a variant of it that works well for the case where Fn is, has sparse support, for example, two squares. And in particular, we can show a mean value theorem variant, which has that if we look at the mean value of, of a n, Dirichlet polynomial, whose coefficients are bounded by a modicative function f, then we get the mean, the square of the density of f. Okay, so we get the same term here and here, but we would need to win this delta squared times h naught to minus c delta kappa compared to this sort of trivial mean value theorem bound. And this is exactly the same situation we had in our previous work. We need to save something compared to the mean value theorem bound. Mean value theorem gives us a trivial result. If we had just this, we, did it, we get that the set of exceptions is of size big O of x, which is completely trivial because there are x numbers. It's not a good thing to have an exceptional set of size big O of x. But but we had to really win something compared to this mean value theorem bound. And we can do it. We can repeat the same arguments because we have this good mean value theorem now. We have to reprove some Haras and Lipschitz type estimates for multiplicative functions in the sparse setting, like where we don't have we have mean values smaller than zero. But we can repeat all those arguments. That's not a problem. But the problem is that at best this gives us instead of this power saving edge naught, this gives us log x to minus kappa. Because Halas can never win more than this, and it's an actual problem. There are modificative functions where you only save this much, where the average is large. And so actually showing what we wanted is in general not possible. There might be some points T here where this this Dirichlet polynomial has size log x to minus kappa, and these contribute like log x to minus kappa to the left hand side. And we wanted to win the power of h naught. So in particular, if h naught is larger than the power of large power of log x, we are in trouble here. So we can't quite show this we wanted. But the method would work if we had a good bound for Dirichlet polynomial, if we had a good bound for Dirichlet polynomial to a prime in certain intervals, which for, say, prime of size epsilon to t, something like that, if we had good saving in those Dirichlet polynomials, then our previous method would work. We could factor out this Dirichlet polynomial, and then we could use the mean value theorem, or we could do a similar thing that we did in our previous work of factoring out different sizes of primes, and eventually it would win thanks to this translation. So if we would have this, we would be happy. But this is in particular for general n, we need, would need to have actually f, f p instead of one here, which is in general not two, but it's problem. And another thing we would need to do is construct a good simulated function for f n to handle those numbers that don't have prime factors from some intervals, but that, that's something we can also do. But anyway, the key new idea is to handle the exceptional p, the p for which we don't have the desired bound like this, before taking the mean square away. So we handle those p for which we don't have this bound before taking the mean square. And then once we take the mean square, we can assume that we are integrating only over those p for which we have this good bound. Okay, so let's get back. Recall that my first formula, we had that this short average can be written as a Quanto integral. And now we split the integration range to two sets T and U, where T belongs to T if we have this desired cancellation for the Dirichlet polynomial over primes of size x2. And by the mean value theorem for Dirichlet polynomials, we can show that for most points T, this is actually true. The size of the exceptional set is at most x over h square root. So most of the points we have this, and then they think that's it. And by the previous discussion, our older work, especially this last week, 
and we still stay where we have good ventilation in the Gilgit polynomial over time. So for that, we get the desired bound. And then we are left with handing the integral over u. So we are left for studying this integral over u, where the set u is pretty sparse. It's a subset of minus x over h to x over h, but it has size only x over h square root. And now we take a new trick. We note that most integers have at least two prime factors from a long interval at least, x to epsilon squared to x to epsilon. So we can, at least morally, we can replace this fn over n to one plus h t. We can replace this by a product of the Gilgit polynomials, where we have sort of taken out the primes from those intervals. And also, we can use Huxley's last value theorem, which is a sort of mean value theorem for Gilgit polynomials, but over a sparse set. And now we have a sparse set because we have this one for u. And we can use it for those p's for which we have ancillation in these polynomials. We can again look at the mean square and we can use the pointwise bound for this, thanks to this bound here. And other parts can be, can be taken care of in the mean square thanks to the sparse set in the integral. And on the other hand, it's possible to show that this holds for most. They so are only like x to epsilon, epsilon exceptions to this. Now we have handled almost all these. We have just like x to epsilon these left for this one. And uh, it's so tiny that we get that this mean here is the of h by using a mean, mean value theorem for multiplicative functions for this and then some a large Montgomery type large value theorem. So like a mean value theorem for the polynomials, but over and now we have a very, very sparse set. So we are able to prove a very sparse set version that works here. And going on, we get, get what we wanted. So I'm going back a lot. Okay, so this is the theorem we got by looking both, uh, moving into the Perron formula, moving into the average of Dirichlet polynomials, but working both on L1 and L2 side. We, we, we alternate between looking at the average over x and not looking at the average over x to be able to handle this thing here. Okay, so let's get back to one last thing, which is the results about positive proportion lower bound, getting the improvement of Hooley's results for gaps. So if one only wants for an f a good exceptional set, if one only wants to show that in almost all short intervals, one has that fn, some of uh, average of fn is at least delta times the expected average. We don't anymore ask for an asymptotic formula, but we just want a positive proportion lower bound, like that there exists some sort of squares or whatever we have then it's an easier task because we don't have to get an asymptotic formula, but we can hook up n in whatever way we wish and only consider those ends. And in this case, it's a good idea to instead of looking at all possible ends, to sum over products of very many numbers, we take k to be like 1 over epsilon 10, and when we look at product of k things, epsilon to 1 over epsilon to 10, things that are small primes, we take k minus one, very small primes, and we take m, which is also very small, but it's an integer, and then we study the product of all these. And because fn is multiplicative, we can also, also split f as a product of k things. And now what we want to show is that this has size at least a constant times the right-hand side here. And this, some of the, these products is definitely of the smaller order of magnitude than this thing here. We can get a lower bound like this. We might double count some things, but at least like epsilon to 10 times. So we get just a constant depending on epsilon. So 
if we want to count all n, it we get so definitely a lower bound if we just count products of k things in these intervals. And now the things get easier because if we look at this Dirichlet polynomial corresponding to this, it can be factored into a product of very short factors. So we have like k very short factors, and this gives us a lot more flexibility when we use all these mean and large value theorems for Dirichlet polynomials. And uh, this allows us to show the result we want. Okay, and that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiser, for this excellent talk. So you can uh, unmute your microphone so we can thank the speaker all together and by clapping. Okay, um, so now we have, uh, we have time for some questions. So I will mute all for just a moment. So there's time for, for questions now. So maybe maybe I'll start with a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, that. Uh, let me stop.